So today is Pentecost Sunday, one of the most special days in our Christian calendar. It's a pivotal day. So let's have a look together at what happened. We're going to be reading from Acts chapter 2. And you've got to think about this, that all the Jews were there in Jerusalem. They were there for one purpose. They were there to go over the 613 laws of Moses. But the Holy Spirit had a different idea. So let's read together from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were staying. And tongues like flames of fire that were divided appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different languages as the Spirit gave them ability to speak. There were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, a crowd came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. And they were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us can hear in our own native language? Moving down then, we hear them speaking the magnificent acts of God in our own languages. Verse 12, they were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, what could this be? But some sneered and said, they're full of new wine. The day of Pentecost was not a mild breeze. Scripture describes it as a violent rush of wind. It was something that you would not have missed. People could hear it in other places. It actually shifted the rafters of the house. It was like a holy hurricane. And these people were so baffled and perplexed. They were confused. They were dumbfounded. They were mentally disturbed by what was going on. They were, wow, what is that? I don't know if you've ever been in a home when a noise has happened and the first thing is, what's going on? You want to know what has happened? Now, when hurricanes appear, they uproot things, they cause devastation, and they can be indiscriminate, but they also are deeply personal. They even actually are given names. Everyone's experience of a hurricane is different. I've got a few pictures of hurricanes for you today that show the utter devastation. There is no doubt that something has happened. There is no doubt that houses have shifted, that cars have shifted, that things have changed. So hurricanes are known for their devastation, but a holy hurricane in our lives can shift things that other things can't. Even a natural hurricane is used to bring about things that we desperately need. Things like turning a red tide so that our, uh, our ecology is in a better place. Things like breaking a drought. You know, today you may have a drought that needs broken, that needs shifted, that you need to see evidence of it moving in your life. And only a holy hurricane from the breath of God will do that. So why did the Holy Spirit come with such force? Well, it was because God was changing people and changing people is not easy. Changing people is not easy. So there was force involved in this situation. We're talking about decades, centuries of people seeing things a certain way. To change that requires a lot of work. It requires something massive. You think about what we've all been through. Think about how we used to use Zoom only casually and now we use it quite often because something major, a crisis, brought forth change. A holy hurricane can bring forth change in your life. Sometimes we need a good shaking. We need a good confounding. We need things to be changed around and shifted. So God was changing people on the day of Pentecost and it took a holy hurricane brought by the Spirit of God to make that change. What did God want to change? Well, he wanted to change people's understanding of who he was and what he was about. 
In essence, he wanted to change their theology in the truest, broadest sense of the word. Theology means how we think about God and how we study God and his nature. For years, the Jews had been studying God and his nature through the 613 rules and laws. But today, there was about to be a change. Pentecost already had a religious center point to it. The center point was this law, the law of Moses. The day of Pentecost had first begun in what we call our Old Testament as an agricultural festival. In Exodus, it talks about Pentecost signaled the end of the barley harvest and the beginning of the wheat harvest. People gave thanks to God for the produce that they were gathering in. By the time the story is told in Acts chapter 2, the Jews had become to associate the festival of Pentecost with the giving of the law of Moses in Mount Sinai. The rabbis taught that it was on Pentecost that God had given Moses the revelation of the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law codes. In other words, Pentecost symbolized the center point of Jewish people. Pentecost was the symbol of the center point of how they lived their lives. They were centered on the law with its lists of orders and sacrifices of animals. In, this, in that sense, the day of Pentecost was more like a celebration, a celebration around God and how he had spoken to Moses and how people were to live their lives. But God had decided that there had to be a shift to their center point. He had decided that the law had run its course. The law of Moses had run its course. It had served its purpose, but it had been an incomplete work. It only got them so far. It had not changed their hearts. Instead, the detailed descriptions of how they were to sacrifice animals and how they were to live had got them all tied up in knots. And God decided there had to be a holy shaking. There had to be a holy hurricane. God sent his son to die on the cross as the perfect sacrifice for sin and to give his people new hearts by which they could fellowship with him. By the time we reach the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, Jesus had given himself already as a sacrifice on the cross. He had died, been buried and been raised from the dead. He had spent his last 40 days with the disciples as the risen Christ. And he was teaching them and preparing them for what was coming, the coming of the Holy Spirit. In one passage, he has told them, you've got everything you need. And then in Acts chapter two, he says, but now wait, because you might have all the head knowledge, but you've got to have the heart knowledge and you've got to have the visceral knowledge. You've got to know, you've got to experience God. You've got to know be beyond a question of a doubt. And he instructed them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait in the city for the coming of the Spirit, which would empower them to be witnesses. Empower them to be witnesses means to empower them to profess and proclaim their faith. You know, often we don't have the courage or the heart to profess or proclaim our faith simply because we haven't waited for that empowering, that thing that takes away all doubt and fear. You know, it was so important that they had a visceral experience of this, a mighty rushing wind, something that was without question, something that all of them could see, something that all of them could experience. Because those Christians were going to have to profess and proclaim their faith in the most difficult situations. In this photograph that, that I have of the last martyrs, the Christian martyrs last prayer, it shows the Christians being prepared to go to the lions. That's what the first century Christians had to do. They had to be prepared to know that what they were living for was worth dying for. And they had had this experience, so they knew. But you know, we still have lions that we need to face today, and you can name a few of them. We have lions in relationships. We have lions at work. We have lions in our mind prowling around. We have lions all over the show. But we can face those lions, and we can profess, and we can proclaim that we have been empowered by the Holy Hurricane, by the Holy Spirit of God. There's lots of literature around Christians being prepared to go into the arena. 
ways that they were to stand, ways that they were just to um, not run around so that their death would be quick and easy and that they would be absent from the body and present with the Lord. You know, we've got to think about what our forefathers, what the people before us have done because they've experienced this God. And this God is your God and this God is my God. And if you don't know him today, he can be your God as well. He can be an experiential God as well as a cognitive God and a heartfelt God. In Acts chapter 2, Jesus had ascended to the Father and received back his full glory that he had voluntarily given up so that he could walk with us and know how we lived. He had become the risen and glorified Christ. The saving work of Christ had been fully accomplished. And on the day of Pentecost, this was the stage of God's plan to relaunch, to reimagine, to revision redemption. And it was yoke easy, burden light. The center point of our faith, of what the Christian, the judo Christian faith was to be, was to be shifted on that day. And God chose a mighty, rushing, violent wind, a holy hurricane to do it. Often crisis causes conversion. Often crisis causes us to shift our center point, to rethink how we're doing things. With the glorified Christ at his side, God blows down the Holy Spirit like a hurricane, like a force to change his people from living out of the law and living out of the Spirit. We may like change. We may say we might like change, but do we really? Do we really like change if it looks like uh, something that's challenging to us? I mean, all of us love change if it looks like an upgrade to our circumstances. Human beings mostly like seeing change that's good. But if it's not good, we see it as loss. If we were like the Jews of the day of Pentecost, we would be seeing this as a loss. We would be thinking that people talking about the ease of of the spirit moving in our life was, was rubbish, that these people were drunk, that they were crazy. It would be so confusing to us. We would be baffled. We would be confounded. Well, we can be confounded today. And often our foolishness is the wisest thing that we can ever acknowledge. It takes the foolishness of a child to confound the wise. Changing people from being led by the law to being led by the spirit is not easy. It usually takes something like a spiritual hurricane to accomplish it, to break through the drought, to stop them fixating and judging. This is true even more for people who've been raised in the church. You may have learned the word grace. You may have sung all the verses of Amazing Grace verbatim. You may have got the t-shirt. You may have watched the film. But to live out grace on a daily basis is an enormous challenge. It doesn't just happen cognitively. It comes from a shift in the Holy Spirit, the holy hurricane that stops you, that shuts your mouth, that stops you from going and saying something that you shouldn't do, that stops you from pushing a thing to to a legal uh, outcome. I heard a story about an old Methodist man. Could have been any other denomination, but in this story, it was a Methodist man. And there was three congregations, a Methodist congregation, a Presbyterian congregation, and a congregational congregation. And they were dwindling in number and they got together a few representatives and they said, look, we really need to be joining our resources and looking at how we can serve our community better. And so they were thinking, well, what can we call ourselves? And they thought for a while, And then they thought, well, the one thing we have in common is that we're all Christians. There was one old Methodist man there and he said, well, he said, I won't stand for this. I was born a Methodist. I was baptized a Methodist. I even married a Methodist. I've been a Methodist all my life and no one is going to make a Christian out of me. You know, that's the way we can be. We can be so stuck and so stuck in our ideas and our law-given approach to things. Many of us live our lives before Christ. 
Even though we have come to Christ ourselves, we live our lives as if we didn't know him in our thinking and in our actions. It doesn't matter if you've grown up in the church. In fact, sometimes it's even worse. We're not to live out of laws and commandments. We're to live out of grace, forgiveness, hope and love. We pay far too much attention to how people dress or how they speak and not enough attention to what is going on in their heart. So Pentecost was a dramatic moment to change the trajectory of where we are today forever to live not out of the law of Moses, but out of the law of the Spirit of God. Peter pleaded with the people and he said, repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Everyone can get this promise. It doesn't matter if you keep the 613 rules or not. You call on the name of the Lord and he will save you. The church of Jesus Christ is not to live out of the law of Moses, nor the law of any church denomination for that matter, nor to live out of the law of the land. Now by that, I don't mean that we're above the law. No, we're not. But the law of grace is greater. There are times where we could push things and legally win a battle, but we have to let it go. The church of Jesus Christ lives out of the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what it means to be a Pentecostal Christian in the true sense of the word, living out of the grace. You know, I just love it that God took 613, shifted it and turned it on its head right around and put 316. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That's simple. One promise and two laws. You know, it was fascinating. In Matthew 22, it says the Pharisees had heard that the Sadducees had been silenced. So they thought they would have a go. And they asked him, they asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus declared, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like unto it, love the Lord, your, love your neighbor as yourself. And on this hangs all the law and the prophets. Love God, love your neighbor. There you go. From 613 to two. You know, it's fascinating. Neuroscience says that at any one time, we can really only focus on two things. God had that idea. He could see us struggling and he wanted to help us out of that struggling. But it took a holy hurricane to do it. Be ready. Things get uprooted when you wait for the Holy Spirit. Things get uprooted when the fire of God comes. Things start to change. You know, God doesn't want to use animals as sacrifices anymore. He has put the fire on us. We are living sacrifices. And the same can happen today. If you want to see the end of the drought in your life, you've got to be prepared to hear the sound of the rain. If you're prepared to hear the sound of the rain, the rain always comes before the hurricane. And you'll see things as God sees them. You'll see them out of grace, not out of law. Then you've got to be prepared for a visceral encounter with God that shakes you and your beliefs to the core. Do not be afraid. Fear not. For God has given us not a spirit of fear, but of love, of power and a sound mind. And we can go forth today on this Pentecost day with the fire of God on us. We are new, we are redeemed, we have broken from the law and we are giving ourselves to the fresh wind of the spirit of God. Get ready and let it rain.